due to the following special program. Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy move to 8 and 8.30 tonight only. Like everyone at this time, the people of Pick and Save are mourning those who lost their lives on the USS Stark. Such a tragic loss shocks us all. But when the shock wears off, it's time to renew our faith and assist those in need. The families of this tragedy will need the help of our entire community. With this in mind, Pick and Save would like to help in spreading the word on how you can assist the families of the brave men who gave their lives for us all. Three funds have been established in support of the USS Stark families. They are the Scholarship Fund for Navy Dependents, the Naval Relief Society Fund, and the USO Construction Fund. Donations may be sent to USS Stark Memorial Funds, Mayport Naval Station, P.O. Box 197, Mayport, Florida, 32228. 0197. These men made themselves immortal by dying for something immortal. That theirs is the best to be asked of any life, a sharing of the human heart, a sharing in the infinite. In giving themselves for others, they made themselves special, not just to us but to their God. This is an Eyewitness News special report. The attack on the USS Stark. Jacksonville mourns. The questions remain. It was a scene those who saw it will never forget. The leader of the free world coming to Mayport to share the grief of the 200 family members who lost sons, husbands, brothers, and fathers in what appears to have been a terrible accident in the waters of the Persian Gulf. The men who died, most of them at the bottom of the military pyramid, were honored by the man at the top, the commander-in-chief. The first lady extended her personal condolences. It was a moment that is uniquely American, and for this day, the world watched as we paid tribute to fallen sailors who were doing their job thousands of miles from home as fate dealt them a cruel and final blow. Good evening, everyone. It was national mourning that Mr. and Mrs. Reagan came to lead at Mayport today. Primarily, they came to console the families and friends of the men whose lives were so abruptly ended in the service of their country by the missiles of a tumultuous Middle East. Words of sorrow from the president. Our task today is simple and sad. To remember to pay tribute to those we loved. Words of prayer from Navy clergy. Father, our words of prayer are inadequate. Please listen instead to the groaning of our stricken souls and give us your peace. Wordless salutes from fellow sailors. The intensity and sincerity of this ceremony could bring tears to the eyes of the most casual observer a ceremony that brought a few moments of comfort to a small group of families and to a nation in the midst of a painful week. For some of us here today, our love is the unquenchable, unforgetting love of a wife, a child, for a fallen father, of a mother, a father, for a fallen son. For others of us, this love, while more distant, is still anguished and grieving. Ours is a love for a fallen countryman who died so that we, a free people, might live and this great nation endure. The families of the 37 men who lost their lives on the Stark listened tearfully to the president's words, sometimes turning to each other for solace, sometimes sobbing silently to themselves. Dignitaries like the Secretary of Defense, the White House Chief of Staff, and the Governor listened too. Neither the president nor the chaplains who spoke at the ceremony claim to have a cure for the hurt the families are feeling. And I wish more than I have ever wished anything in my life that I possess the skill and the words to take away that grief and to heal that pain and to restore that loss. But you and I know that such words 
don't exist. But there were assurances that a better life had beckoned the 37 sailors. God has tried them and found them worthy of himself. As gold would be proved in the furnace, so were they. As sacrificial offerings, he took them unto his bosom. Those who trust in God shall understand the truth, and the faithful shall abide with him in love, because the grace and the mercy of our God is with them. For his part, the president tried to assure the families their sons, husbands, and fathers had not died in vain, that they had helped patrol the Persian Gulf, an area he called a crossroads for three continents and vital to our nation's security, an area wracked by more than six years of war between Iran and Iraq that the president said could erupt into a wider conflict if the United States does not keep a steady watch. It is a region that is a crossroads for three continents and the starting place for the oil that is the lifeblood of much of the world economy, especially those of our allies in Europe. Even more important, this is a region critical to avoiding larger conflict in the tinderbox that is the Middle East. The president said, although the families will never again spend a spring afternoon, a Thanksgiving, or a Christmas together with their loved one, they may perhaps they find some satisfaction now, in knowing their husband, no father, or son helped America stay safe and free like so many generations of sailors and soldiers before them. Young Americans of the USS Stark gave up their lives so that the terrible moments of the past would not be repeated, so that wider war and greater conflict could be avoided, so that thousands and perhaps millions of others might be spared the final sacrifice these men so willingly made. As he has done in so many other speeches, the president chose to highlight an individual who he says provides a brave example to others. This time he referred to senior chief Jerry Kleinfelter, a Mayport officer who lost his son on the Stark, but had the courage to press on and help others amidst his grief. He had volunteered to work at the coordinating center here for the families when he received word that his own son, Seaman Brian Kleinfelder, previously listed as missing in action, was among the confirmed dead. I need to keep working, he said. He stayed at his post. He carried on. Well, so too, we must carry on. We must stay at our post. We must keep faith with their sacrifice. The president said the burden of death is more difficult in peacetime than wartime, each casualty being all the more unexpected, but no less a sacrifice, a sacrifice of what John Kennedy called a bitter peace. And so we ask, why did this happen? Why to them? Could anything be worth such a sacrifice? And these fallen, whom we knew and loved, but rarely thought of as great men or legends, can we now truly say they are heroes? And even if we can, would we not rather have them back? Ordinary men again, perhaps, but still ours, ours to hold and to keep. After his speech, Mr. Reagan made his way through the mourners, stopping to console each family member personally. Mrs. Reagan, sometimes tearfully, offered her embrace. No one knows what the President and First Lady told the families during those private moments, but Mr. Reagan very clearly told the nation how he regards the men of the Stark. Heroes, the President said, are ordinary men who do extraordinary things. Quoting a famous author, Mr. Reagan asked, what are heroes but men who embody the virtues of a whole people? Those that died did embody the best of us. Yes, they were ordinary men who did extraordinary things. Yes, they were heroes. Some of the family members inside that helicopter hangar today were overcome by grief and had to be escorted outside. It was extremely warm inside the hangar and extremely emotional. The President and Mrs. Reagan stayed until each and every family member had been spoken to and embraced. Eyewitness News reporter Tad Clifliff has been at the Mayport Navy base every day this week covering the preparations for today's ceremony. Tad Clifliff was inside the hangar uh, watching as the, as the president and the families uh, went through this ceremony today. Let's go to Tad now outside the Mayport Navy base. Tad? 
Tom, we were covering that broadcast live earlier in the day, and I think we both made the comment this is a very difficult, very emotionally emotional story to cover. I don't know anyone who walked out of that ceremony emotionally untouched. The pain has hit home. President and Mrs. Reagan landed to a grieving base today. 200 immediate relatives of the Stark victims wait inside, holding each other, comforting each other through what one observer called the Navy's final farewell. So today we remember them in sorrow and in love. We say goodbye. This was private grief. After a 21-gun salute, the president and Mrs. Reagan consoled each of the 200 family members. Mr. Reagan told the families there is nothing he can say, nothing he could do to take their pain away. Visiting dignitaries who attended the service echoed his comments. When some of them openly were weeping and all, was that there's just no way that we can even begin to feel, you know, any share of the pain that, uh, that they're feeling. I think the president did such a consoling act for the families and it touched uh, everyone who, who heard him as he talked about why it's necessary to put uh, our fighting men and women at risk, uh, what the reason for the sacrifice uh, is, and then hope uh, for their loved ones, for themselves, and for our nation. It was a very moving experience. Of course, you see all those young uh, wives and parents and several infants, uh, perhaps the, uh, the offspring of one of the uh, deceased uh, sailors. And, uh, and of course, you, uh, you sense the emotion of the event. And, uh, you know, as a, as a proud American, you, you have a deep pain. The, uh, the entire ceremony was, was uh, well done. Uh, the, at the end with the taps and the 21 gun salute, very emotional. Uh, yeah, I sat there and, and, and tried as I may to stay staunchly uh, manly, and I sobbed like a baby with everybody. It was a very, very highly emotional time for us all. While the nation focused its attention on Mayport today, Washington is still seeking answers to this stark attack. Senator Graham today promised a full inquiry. The most immediate thing the Congress is going to try to do is to find out just what happened uh, to determine what uh, steps need to be taken in order to better defend our uh, military and particularly our naval fleet in areas of jeopardy. They can know that they can know how much we all hurt. Mayport Naval Station spokesmen say they continue to receive money for the surviving relatives. All of it will go to the families who the Navy knows will have a difficult next year. I just talked with uh, part of the Naval Family Services Unit, and, uh, and he was talking about what they were doing. And they will follow each one of these families for over a year. And uh, obviously, you know, anything we can do, we want to do too. Uh, I think that is terribly important because uh, they shouldn't be forgotten. The ceremony is over, a time that one counselor fears may be the worst time for the mourning families. When the media ultimately turns its attention to another subject, when the president leaves, and after the families of the USS Stark bury their loved ones, that, he says, is when their courage will be tested. The grief will not end for them soon. For some of the families, there is yet another ceremony. The first of the remains are scheduled to arrive in Dover, Delaware tomorrow. Tom and Deborah? Thank you, Tad. Tad Clipliff reporting live from the outside the Mayport Navy base. Still to come in the remainder of this hour, a look at some of the questions in the aftermath of the missile attack on the Stark, questions pertaining to the U.S. Persian Gulf policy and U.S. military readiness. Questions that concern the families of the men of the Stark, even in their time of grief. Also, when we return, We'll be visiting with some of those closest to this tragedy.
There's more to a city than commerce and industry. A city draws energy and presence from the people who make up the various communities it serves. When one community is hurting, we all hurt. The web that holds us together is a fragile one. It bends and gives, but it never breaks. One of Jacksonville's communities is hurting now, and the rest of us are offering support, love, and friendship. The people of Pick and Save would like to take this moment to express their deepest sympathy to the families and friends of the brave men whose lives were lost on the USS Stark. And to the survivors, we wish them Godspeed in bringing them home safely. The naval community is vital to Jacksonville, and Pick and Save recognizes its contribution not only to our city, but also to the nation. Its role in keeping our country safe and free is often a dangerous task. Looking ahead, we all know that we must move on and carry out the duties which lie ahead of us. In the words of Abraham Lincoln, with malice toward none, with charity for all, let us finish the work we are in to bind up the nation's wounds. The tragedy of what happened aboard the Stark has touched so many lives. In one instant, so many dreams shattered. Robin Saran talked with families and friends whose lives now will never be the same. 25-year-old Susan Riles walked out of St. Paul's Catholic Church this afternoon, the realization sinking in that she is now a widow. A funeral service was held for her husband, Earl Patton Riles was among the 37 men who lost their lives aboard the USS Stark. We have to think of those sailors as being heroes, people who were there to defend us. And I believe that this recognition is going to make people realize that these, these men are out there risking their lives for us. Susan and her husband had planned to start a family as soon as he returned home. I feel very badly towards the women that do have children and how much they must be suffering right now at this time. Uh, I couldn't imagine that would be unbearable for me. Stephen Kaiser's wife and son had been living in Bahrain so the family could be together whenever Stephen got off the ship. On Wednesday morning, Barbara and five-year-old John Kaiser were there when Stephen's flag-draped coffin was carried by. But Barbara Kaiser feels no hatred toward the people responsible for taking her husband's life. The family has deep religious convictions, and her pastor says she sent a Bible to Iraq to be given Sometimes to the pilot who fired the fatal something. missile. She quoted that verse of scripture that says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then she said to him in a note that was translated into Arabic, John and I, that's her son, uh, John and I forgive you for what you've done. It was just a month ago when Vernon Foster was promoted to chief senior petty officer on board the USS Stark. Foster was in the Navy almost 16 years. He planned to retire in four years after making Master Chief. He wanted to spend more time with his family. Vernon Foster leaves behind a wife and seven children. Foster's mother is trying to understand why her son had to give his life. I love my son very, very much. And I miss him very, very much already. And I guess this is just a, a, a pinch of what it's going to really be, that, be like in the months and the years to come because he was such a special person. He was not just my son, but he was my friend. I don't understand why. I'm not saying that I question God, that he did this, because that's not what I'm saying. The Lord learned him, loaned him to me for just for a short time. I knew that he was temporary when he was born into the world. I didn't think that he would die before me. And for him to have died the way he did, I don't understand, and I feel that it should never have happened. And somewhere along the line, I would like to know what really went wrong. And I don't mean someone telling me that it was a mistake, and we're sorry, because it was no mistake. 
But Foster's mother says she can rest easier, knowing that her son was good to people and that he will not be forgotten. One sailor who left the Stark just five hours before the attack has special memories of Vernon Foster. Greg Saxon says he will cling to the last words of advice Foster gave him. When I was departing the ship, he uh, pulled me over to the side when I was checking out. He told me that uh, you have to deal with adversity. I knew that adversity is part of coming to man. Greg Saxon's tour duty was up on May 17th. He was heading home when he heard his ship had been attacked. He hasn't been able to sleep, thinking only of the special friends he left behind. Your family. I feel sorry for the guys that died. My heart grieves for them. Some of my friends, some I associated with, and I knew, and everybody knew each other by our first name basis, and. Everybody talked to each other, and you know, everybody was like kind of close friends with each other. Saxon planned to meet his best friend, Vince Ulmer, when the Stark sailed home in August. I remember the day he left, he shook me on my back and told me he was going to be, be there on August the 5th to see me. He wanted me to be standing on the pier for him. And I said, sure, that would be no problem for me to stand on the pier for you on August the 5th. Now I can't even stand the pier for one. Saxon says he is anxious to get on a ship again and carry out the missions of the 37 sailors who lost their lives for America. There was one bright moment amidst all the tragedy. It was early Monday morning. A healthy baby girl was born here at Memorial Medical Center. The baby's father was on board the USS Stark. Little Jessica Nelson's father was among the survivors. While Tracy Nelson was in labor, all she knew was that there had been an attack on the Stark. For the next two days, her family kept her sheltered from any news until they knew for sure that Michael Nelson was safe. I feel lucky, and he feels lucky. <laughs> he said he couldn't believe he's alive. And while Tracy Nelson feels so lucky, she grieves for the other families who were not as fortunate. All the sons and daughters, all the mothers and fathers, all the brothers and sisters, and all the girlfriends and wives who must now go through their lives without the men they loved from the USS Stark. Much of the grieving at Mayport has been centered at the Mayport Chapel. Chaplain Bill Perry has told us earlier in the week that although there's nothing that he can do or many of the grief counselors can do to ease the pain, perhaps knowing of the degree of caring that's going on around these people will help them as the days and months go on. Well, much of this city's attention, and the nation's for that matter, has been focused on the Mayport Naval Station today. Not all eyes were. The community and the Navy do have a close relationship, and there was respect from a distance. But for others, Eyewitness News reporter Michael Dillon tells us life goes on. Separation. While services were being held inside Mayport Naval Station, outside there were subtle reminders that today was somehow different. Automobile headlights burning in respect small businesses near the base, remembering in their own simple way. In the tiny village of Mayport, in the shadow of the base, the fishing and shipping industry continued with normal routines. Construction continued for more military housing, seemingly oblivious to the grief around them. And a normally popular lunch spot was mostly empty, perhaps more to do with presidential security than with military sorrow. I think it's a terrible tragedy. I don't know the solution to it, but I think we should do something more than just accept it. But I don't want a full-scale war either. Motorists waiting at the Mayport Ferry. And I, I think that we, we don't need to take it. I mean, 20 years ago, USS Liberty got attacked by Israel, and they said that, you know, we didn't identify our boat when we did. They didn't recognize the flag. They couldn't read the emblem on the side of the boat. And I don't think you can, you know, bomb a ship and fly three planes over and not recognize a flag. What do you say? What kind of retaliation are we going to make? I don't, you know, that would be a lot more killing and all. I don't think they ought to go for that. Yeah. What, what yeah. you going to do? Let them just keep on killing our men and, and get by with it? You know, you got to do something. you got to stop these idiots, you know? Yeah, but just 30 people, you know, I mean, it could wind up to be 30,000 or something, you know? Yeah. That'd be unreal. Some off-duty Navy personnel went through routine household chores, choosing not to watch the president and the memorial service. 
Not allowed to do interviews, others complain privately that America's military has turned into little more than a paper tiger. For others, though, there were some things to think about, such as at Mayport Elementary School, Mrs. Adams' third grade class. The children, most of them military dependents, watched with unusual attention. They have two or three in here whose fathers are still out to sea. They were like uh, just uh, ships that were stationed out doing the same thing. And so they've been like concerned, when is my father coming home? How long will he have to stay out? And this has been some of their concerns. The question that's been in a lot of the third graders' mind is why did it have to happen? You know, and um, uh, we studied about um, some of the wars you know, and they were saying that their parents are saying this is peacetime and this shouldn't really have happened, but I don't think they're old enough to really know the significance. Do you think the president was a very good man for coming down and talking to the families? Yes. Okay. Are you going to be very nice to the family members that are still here at Mayport? Yes. yes. And while children were being exposed to the realities of the world, at Lucky's Barbershop down the street, some who had seen war before reflected on what it all meant. It makes it hard for people to understand that this could happen, I think, you know. That's the way the families were over there. I'm quite sure they felt, how can this happen? And this is peacetime, and we're not at war. And, you know, it's just the way it goes. A lot of, a lot of guys think of it happening, but they very seldom talk about it, you know? Because it could happen. It's easy to happen. You might retire from That's the service, right. but oh, you're I'm always part of it because that was your life. No, you don't ever shake that. You'll always be Navy or, or retired or otherwise. You know. When Deborah and I were at the Mayport Navy base this morning to cover the ceremony, there was certainly no questioning of United States government policies, foreign policy, and military policies. You would never expect to find military personnel questioning the policies of their commander-in-chief on such an occasion. Of course, in Washington, on Capitol Hill in particular, there is constant questioning of the commander-in-chief's policies. And we're going to go live now to our Eyewitness News Washington correspondent and bureau chief, Tina Galland. What kind of questions were being asked today, Tina? Well, Tom, basically the same questions that have been asked since this incident occurred last Sunday. The surprise attack on the Stark shocked official Washington. It also put the Pentagon on the spot. And it produced a number, as you say, of very basic questions about U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East and about the American military presence in the Persian Gulf. On Sunday, within 90 minutes of the Iraqi attack on the Stark, President Reagan was notified of the missile strike. National Security Advisor Frank Carlucci told the President the ship had been hit, presumably with a French-made Exocet missile, capable of skimming just above the water's surface to its target. The frigate was on fire and listing badly, making it virtually impossible for the Pentagon to get an accurate report on the extent of damage and the death toll. The ship has been subjected to the shock of a sudden and unprovoked attack. Given all that and flooding and fire, the captain is doing the best he can to tell higher authority the exact status of his crew. When the smoke cleared, the Navy knew 37 had perished. I want to express my deepest sympathies to the families of the brave men killed and injured yesterday aboard the USS Stark. As the Stark made its way to port in Bahrain, the president put American vessels in the Gulf on full alert, and the search for answers began. Why had the Iraqi pilot fired on a friendly vessel on a peacekeeping mission in the Gulf? A mistake, the administration said. But I don't have any question in my mind that the pilot of the Iraqi aircraft meant to fire his missiles at the target he saw on his radar screen. He apparently didn't care enough to find out what ship he was shooting at, or he was reluctant to get close enough to make anything like a positive identification. No possible motive, he said, for the Iraqi pilot to intentionally fire on the Stark. But why had the Stark failed to use its sophisticated phalanx anti-missile system to defend itself? The captain said the system was on manual, not automatic, and no alarm of an oncoming missile had been sounded until too late. When the lookout reported the incoming missile, uh, it was only a matter of a couple seconds 
as we started to take action that the missile actually hit the ship. Questions about possible computer failures and about the number of missiles carried on the Iraqi warplane persist. They'll be answered by a naval board of inquiry now investigating in Bahrain. A second probe will be conducted jointly by the U.S. and Iraq in Baghdad beginning next week. On Capitol Hill, a full-blown review of the policy in the Gulf. What are our goals? What is our strategy? What are the risks and how much costs are will we willing to pay? And concern about the risks of a White House plan to expand the American naval presence in the Gulf and extend protection to Kuwaiti oil tankers. Not being able to defend a single ship of our own, we are engaging ourselves in the responsibility to ensure the safety of Kuwaiti ships. On what basis? Can we fight off expected missile or ship attacks if they're launched? Or are we relying solely on deterrence? This weekend, to underscore Congress's interest and concern about the policy in the Middle East and about the conditions in the Gulf, the uh, Congress has sent a delegation to Bahrain and they will begin a fact-finding mission which will last several days and then they'll come back here to Washington to report. Tom, Deborah. Tina, one of the members of that delegation is Senator John Glenn, who said today that it is time to stop bluffing. He referred to the bombing of the Marine barracks in Lebanon and again to the attack on the Stark. Is that a common feeling on Capitol Hill that America's presence in these parts of the world uh, is simply a bluff, that we don't have enough muscle behind our presence? Deborah, what I heard again and again this week is if we're there, we want to make sure we are there in enough force and strength to protect our own people. And that may mean air cover, that may mean moving carriers closer to our warships. What I heard repeatedly is we've got to be clear on what our presence there means and be able to back it up with whatever power we, we need. And that's why we're going to have a discussion between the White House, the administration, the State Department, and Capitol Hill in coming weeks about exactly what our presence in the Persian Gulf means and what we need to do to protect the people that we send there. Tina, we've heard quite a bit of chest pounding uh, from Capitol Hill all week, um, but as somebody said earlier today, the president is pretty much free to set these policies and, and carry them out. I mean, he has not, uh, under the War Powers Act, he's not had to go to Congress and, and discuss it. Um, short of uh, the publicity that the congressman can get, um, is there anything substantive that they can do to uh, force the president to conduct a policy that's different from the one that he wants to run? Well, I think they can put a lot of pressure on the president, and certainly the White House listens. Uh, something like, for instance, the uh, sale of F-15 jets to the Saudis, that's something the White House wants to do. That has now been put on hold because, as uh, Senator Byrd said, this is not the right time to ask for Congress's cooperation on that kind of a foreign policy issue. The White House needs Congress's support on that kind of an issue and many others. And so the White House is going to have to be saying credible things on our presence in the Persian Gulf to be able to get done the things it needs to get done. So that's the kind of an issue, Tom, that is going to make the di difference and is going to encourage the White House to be able to move towards some kind of an agreement with Congress on what we ought to be doing. Thank you very much, Tina. Tina Galland reporting live from our Washington Bureau. Deborah. Thank you, Tom. Joining us now live in our studio is Congressman Charles Bennett. We appreciate you joining us, Congressman. What would you have to say to the families, many of whom you represent out at Mayport, who are in such intense period of suffering right now? Well, mostly I would say America loves you and loves your lost one. America is grateful for the sacrifice that's being made, and America gives you every possible sympathy, and you should not feel as if somehow or another this was not an important thing that your son or father or brother did. It was very important. In the discussion that's gone previously in this hour, there seem to be some people that have a doubt about what we were doing. That's not a, a new presidential idea to keep the sea lanes open. Our first war, the Battle of Tripoli, was on this matter in 1804. We have always, even when we were an infant republic, maintained that the sea lane should be open to everybody and that freedom should be encouraged throughout the world. So these young men who gave their lives, in fact gave their lives to an extremely old principle of our country, extremely old international principle, and, and the, the parents and loved ones should not feel as if 
something futile was done. A great sacrifice was done, but not a futility. It was in the process of not just this president's policy, but all president's policies since the beginning of our republic. What can we do to ensure that this kind of accident, if in fact it was an accident, won't happen again? Uh, are our defenses strong enough in the Persian Gulf? Could there have been human error aboard this ship? Well, you can't prevent somebody making a mistake. And so far, the evidence does indicate that the pilot thought he was shooting at one of the two targets, which were legitimate targets, that he shot at earlier in the day, mm -hmm. uh, two freighters in the near vicinity. Every indication is that's what he thought he was doing. He should have done better. He should have made a, more, a greater identity. But bear in mind, all he gets back on his radar is a blob of light. He doesn't get the frame of the ship. He just gets a blob of light back. And this was at night. And so it's not in any way inconceivable that he, it might have been a complete a mistake. In fact, I think it probably was a complete mistake. Can, now, can American forces do anything to guard against a mistake like that? Well, we have, we have facilities on these ships which are designed to cut down these weapons coming toward us. And why they were not used has not yet been addressed in any evidence because nobody has been called before any group to, to be heard. And those hearings will transpire. They will take place. And we'll eventually know why it was that even though this particular facility, which was designed to strike down an exit or other type missile like that, was in a position of uh, manual operation, and even if it were in manual operation, why the flash signal did not come and alert somebody, because there is a flash signal, as I understand it, in that facility, even when it's in the manual position. So somebody should have observed that if my knowledge of this particular defensive weapon is accurate. Now, uh, in the end of this, however, you sh people should not get carried away, particularly the loved ones, should not feel like some evil thing was done to their soldier or sailor, because anybody who goes into the military service expects to have great danger around them. You can't, I remember my mother used to write to me in New Guinea in the Philippines and say she's praying every night that I'll be out of danger. And I write back to her, Mama, don't pray that I'll be out of danger. Pray that I come back alive. Just pray for that. Because I'm in danger every second of my life. And, and that's what a soldier and a sailor does. And so these loved ones should not have a bitterness in their heart about their loved ones losing their life for a non-principle or something not important or something just on this president. The policy that they were sustaining is a nationwide uh, from the beginning of our history, principle of keeping the sea lanes open. Now, it's true we ought to try to get more help from Japan and, and from Great Britain, perhaps, and certainly Germany in this effort. Uh, it's true that we don't have enough carriers. We should have 22 carriers. That's what the Joint Chiefs of Staff say, and that's what we used to have. We're working to try to get a 15-carrier group. We do now have that now, a 15 carriers, but we really should have 22. It, it, you can't just say we have a Navy, therefore do everything we want to give to the Navy to do. They, they, they can't be everywhere at once. If there had been a carrier in the area, they could have shot down that particular plane. And that would be a positive thing from the standpoint of the immediate response. Uh, we didn't have that kind of air carrier cover, but that wasn't carelessness. That was because we couldn't afford to have the carriers there because we don't have enough carriers. Okay. Thank you, Congressman. We appreciate you joining us. Congressman Charles Bennett. Tom? Earlier this week, we spoke to Iraq's ambassador to the United States in Washington, Nizar Hamdoun. This was Tuesday evening, and at that point, his government had not prepared a detailed account from the pilot of exactly what took place on Sunday. We're going to go back now to Ambassador Hamdoun in Washington. Mr. Hamdoun, can you tell us now, has your government uh, talked in detail to the pilot, and uh, can you tell us on this broadcast uh, what the pilot said about the events of Sunday? Yes, they have been talking in detail with him and with the other uh, relevant authorities. Uh, what, in the what Air did Force, and, but uh, the question is that we are in no position to reveal anything before sitting down with the American team, which is in its way now to Baghdad. We believe that this issue should be addressed mutually. Iraq cannot really, uh, just out of what it has in hand, just out of the reports that we got from the pilot and from others, to give exactly what has happened before comparing notes and before listening to the American evidence or to the American things that had to do with that tragic incident. So I feel that we are going to wait until 
something jointly comes from the Iraqi American investigation. Mr. Ambassador, could you just tell us what the pilot said he thought he was shooting at? I don't know exactly what the pilot have said. Uh, the things are taking place now in Baghdad in preparation for the joint meetings with the American team. But obviously, uh, the pilot have, has indicated that he was thinking he was shooting an Iranian uh, target, and they were looking for Iranian targets in that same vicinity for weeks. And in fact, the same night, uh, we had, I think, two other hits on Iranian targets in this same vicinity of the American ship. You said earlier this week when we talked on Tuesday night that if it was found that the pilot had done something wrong, uh, there was a good possibility that he would be disciplined. What, uh, Absolutely. What, what kind of discipline would we be talking about here? What kind of punishment, perhaps? I don't know. Really, I'm no military expert. I don't know exactly what the military law implies in here for the Iraqi military law. But what I'm sure about that uh, he will be disciplined in that case. Your government has made it clear that uh, it is amenable to the idea of compensation for the families of the 37 Americans who were killed. Would you have any idea uh, what amount of compensation that might be involved here? I mean, what can your government afford in a situation like this? And how do you, how do you replace a, a seaman, a man who, whose life is lost? We have accepted the principle of uh, compensation to the families and to the government of the United States. But to get into the te details right now is pretty uh, premature, and I believe that we should sit down and negotiate with the, with the American authorities. The American request itself didn't discuss any details, but they put that request also in a principle. Mr. Ambassador, here in the studio with us, as you may have heard, uh, right, is Congressman Charles Bennett of Florida. And uh, Congressman Bennett has a question he'd like to ask you, if that would be all right. Please, Mr. Congressman. I, I would like to ask uh, if it's true, which I've heard, that you, you have apologized for any uh, action that you, your company may, country may have made in this and feel it, in fact, it was a, an accident. Yeah, that's true, Mr. Congressman. We had, in the last uh, three days, two letters from President Saddam Hussein to President Reagan and uh, through him to the families of the victims, where he indicated that this was an intentional, unintentional, tragic mistake, and he showed his feeling, his profound feelings about uh, this tragedy, and he showed that the Iraqi people shared with him the deep sorrow about this incident. So, yes, they were, uh, I think, um, I would like to say, uh, somewhat in support of that, that I have chaired two hearings in Congress since this occurred, one the day after the event and one just day before yesterday. And in these hearings, it is clear that uh, your uh, airplanes had been firing on uh, freighters, which you were entitled to fire on, in that general area. And after all, this was at night. so. My own feeling on the basis of information I so far received is well, it was, in fact, an accident. You have no motive in your country for wanting to do anything uh, harmful to the United States. And there was strong evidence it was an accident, unless the pilot himself says something to the contrary. It would seem to me it's pretty clear that it was an accident. Your, your country has apologized for it and uh, are willing to make recompense to the families. I must say I was recently involved in a another incident of a similar nature, the Gander crash. And when those people came to me, uh, none of the families talked about money. They all talked about how to prevent things like this occurring in the future. So I think we're underestimating the emotions of these families in, in that regard. The emotions of the families are, are upon the loss of their loved ones and not upon dollars and cents, in my opinion. Yeah, that's true. I share with you the same thinking. And on this investigation that we uh, uh, propose from the first few hours after the incident that we like to work jointly on this. It's not just to get to the bottom of that, which is very important, but also to try to work out some uh, new arrangements and measures to prevent this thing from happening again. Mr. Ambassador, thank you very much for being with us, and Congressman Bennett, thank, thank you. you also for being with us. We'll be back in a moment. We'll be talking with the shipbuilder of the USS Stark, and we'll have some other news for you, too. Why? It's a question being asked tonight by many families and friends of the brave men who were injured or lost their lives on the USS Stark. There is no easy answer, and there may never be just one answer. 
Our nation mourns the loss of any man or woman who is killed while defending not only our country, but the free world. We as a nation have a responsibility to the world community. It is an enormous task. And the men of the USS Stark took on that task with dignity and perseverance. Many have gone before them. But there is one common thread throughout all the lost lives in our history. They died protecting their families and ours. The inspiration throughout history is the knowledge that families like yours are behind them, offering encouragement and support. Their deaths are not in vain. From the pick and save family to all of those who have lost a son, husband, father, brother, or friend, our hearts go out to you in deepest sympathy. Also joining us this evening is the man uh, partly in charge of building the frigate USS Stark, da Dan McDonnell of Todd Shipyards. And one of the things that Congressman Bennett told me earlier, being in charge of uh, shipbuilding and whatever and the various uh, roles he serves in Congress, is there's been considerable concern about the materials used in constructing the Stark, primarily the aluminum, Mr. McDonnell, and some concern that the aluminum may have caused some of the casualties, the burning of the aluminum. Can you tell us if, in fact, that did cause any of the, of the casualties and what you know about the construction of the ship? Well, the, uh, the superstructure, of course, is aluminum, um, uh, and this, the hull is steel. Uh, I really couldn't uh, comment too much. Uh, I wouldn't expect the aluminum to uh, uh, have caused any more casualties. Uh, the ship is well equipped with firefighting equipment and firefighting systems. Are you familiar at all with the Felix anti-missile system, or are you, in fact, more involved with the nuts and bolts of the ship? Not that familiar. We've, we, of course, installed the equipment on the ship, but we're not, uh, we're not authorities on that, uh, that type of equipment. Now, you're the manager of the shipyard that has built the ship, and I would, I would expect you to say um, that it was a fine ship in, in, in good condition. Uh, we're showing you some, our viewers now, some pictures of uh, the ship actually under construction. Is this frigate built any different from any others? Is it, in fact, state-of-the-art? It's pretty much a state-of-the-art for this type of ship. It's a um, uh, destroyer-type ship. High speed, very maneuverable. It's pretty standard. Mr. McDonald, this is Tom Wills. You have seen the uh, pictures, undoubtedly, the videotape from uh, off the coast of Bahrain of the damage that the ship sustained. Could you give us even a rough idea of what might be involved in repairing this ship? How long it might take? Well, it's, uh, I have seen the pictures on the media, of course, and uh, it's, uh, the, the structural part is, uh, is not that difficult to repair. Uh, some of the equipments, possibly, that were damaged might uh, might have some kind of a lead time, but um, we wouldn't know about that. How about future ship construction? What, uh, you know, from, from this episode, is there anything that uh, your company uh, in particular and the country in general can learn about uh, future Navy ships from this particular incident? Well, I'm sure uh, the Navy uh, always can learn from uh, experience like this, and I'm sure they will. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. That is Dan McDonald, manager of the Todd Shipyards in Seattle, who's joining us live. Tom. Admiral Eugene Carroll spent a total of uh, 37 years of active duty with the military, and, uh, but these days he is now the, the deputy director of the Center for Defense Information in Washington, D.C., and we've heard a couple of times from, from Admiral uh, Carroll this week about, uh, about the frigates. One of the things that I wanted to ask Admiral Carroll was that uh, I saw a quote from you, sir, uh, that said that uh, the Navy's word for frigates was versatile and that you said that uh, what that really meant was that was kind of code for useless. I mean, is that really what you think of the Stark and other ships of her kind? I have a definition of versatile which is not very good in a number of missions. Remember, the frigate was originally designed to be a low-cost ship that had a specialty in anti-submarine warfare, and its protection would come from the carriers and the cruisers in which it, uh, with which it operated. Over the years, we've gradually loaded that frigate up with other systems. We've cut down on its ASW capability. So now it's supposedly able to fight submarines, surface ships, airplanes, and missiles. And obviously, it has a limited capability to do each of those missions. 
Admiral Carroll, we've heard uh, quite a bit this week and uh, even more tonight about the uh, possibilities of a breakdown with the failing system. Obviously, there's no definitive on that wor word on that yet until the uh, Navy completes its investigation. But even if the failing system would have been working exactly as it was supposed to, how effective could that uh, system have been against that incredible missile? The phalanx throws out a stream of 20 millimeter cannon shells, 20 millimeter being a little less than an inch around. Uh, it fires them at about the rate of 3,000 a minute, so that's a lot of iron going out, but it only can be brought, be brought to bear on the missile, which is approaching at 600 miles an hour, for about 10 to 12 seconds. That's like trying to hit a basketball coming at you at 10 miles a minute with one of these little slugs. So the odds, I'm afraid, favor the missile when it comes down to that final close-in effort by the phalanx gun. After the uh, week-long investigation uh, so far, Admiral Carroll, this is Deborah Jean Ola speaking to you. Is there anything, do you feel, that has been left unsaid so far? Anything that we should be concerned about that has not been raised? I've heard several uh, commentaries this evening in which they were raising questions about the captain's responsibility, and I would like to go once more on record as saying the captain was a prudent, experienced seaman, clearly in charge of his ship, and he hasn't committed any errors. There's going to have to be a careful investigation in depth, not only of the captain's performance and the ship's performance, but the performance of the chain of command and maybe we're going to find that the basic problem was they put a ship which did not have adequate defenses against a cruise missile attack in a position without any other support where it was unable to defend itself even though everything was done uh, that was in the power of the captain and the crew to do. Admiral Carroll, thank you very much for being with us. That was Admiral Eugene Carroll of the Center for Defense Information joining us live from Washington. We're going to be back in a moment with some closing comments. Please stay tuned. Like everyone at this time, the people of Pick and Save are mourning those who lost their lives on the USS Stark. Such a tragic loss shocks us all. But when the shock wears off, it's time to renew our faith and assist those in need. The families of this tragedy will need the help of our entire community. With this in mind, Pick and Save would like to help in spreading the word on how you can assist the families of the brave men who gave their lives for us all. Three funds have been established in support of the USS Stark families. They are the Scholarship Fund for Navy Dependents, the Naval Relief Society Fund, and the USO Construction Fund. Donations may be sent to USS Stark Memorial Funds, Mayport Naval Station, P.O. Box 197, Mayport, Florida, 32228-0197. A former Stark crew member who was discharged in April left the ship with more than memories. He was the welfare and recreation officer aboard the ship responsible for keeping his crewmates' spirits up. One of the ways he did that was with home video equipment. Ted Brown tells us more. You have a 200-man crew and everybody's like your family. On board for three and a half years, John Melvin saw crewmen come and go on the Stark. During that time, it was part of his job to provide a laugh or two to the men, which he did with the help of videotape. The company's the theme, isn't it cool and pink? And we'll be right back with a look at sports with uh, <laughs> Chuck <Hi>. Stevenson. <laughs> we did a type of a news program where it was kind of a comedy news where we do it for everybody on board the crew, uh, where they'd be able to sit down for at least a half hour every day and watch a program and laugh about the program and try to forget about some of the things that were going on where they could basically relax and everything. But the tapes that were shot for fun, even though of poor quality, are now priceless because they captured forever the faces and voices of some of the men who just a few weeks later would be dead. Montana South to Arizona. Oh my gosh! 
this flash just in. From California Men like James West Stevens Plains, giving a mock Colorado. weather forecast. STRK News would like to extend congratulations to Lieutenant Moncrief on the birth of his son. Chris DeAngelis having some fun in Arab dress. I kept the tape uh, basically for the memories. When I first heard, I was kind of in shock about it, you know, hearing about it and wondering what would have been if I would have still been there. What would it have been like? But I feel my friends that had died, you know, died because they were proud for this country. And I know everybody on that ship pulled together and did what they could. Here at Stark News, would like to tell you, there's only 149 days left. Enjoy it. Copies of the tapes will go to the families. Ted Brown, Channel 4 Eyewitness News. A few thoughts before we say good night. The story of the Stark has been an anxious and trying time for this community. Just a week ago, only the families of Navy men aboard the Stark and other ships in the Persian Gulf gave much thought to that part of the world. And then their thoughts were mostly personal. Thoughts of longing and loneliness for the husbands, sons, and dads who had left home to help their country. We had no overt reason to fear the worst, but on Sunday, the worst happened. Two missiles, probably fired in error, suddenly thrust 37 anonymous men and their families into national prominence. Their private grief became public. Their anger, our anger. Their questions, our questions. But for most of us, their pain, we can only imagine. Almost as suddenly as the Stark made the headlines, it will disappear from the headlines. The investigation into why it happened will end. The stories about the Stark and the men aboard will fade. And the Navy goes on, as is its duty. 37 families will go on with their lives, too, but it will be a long time, if ever, before the anger, the questions, and the pain can fade. Their men died for us. This is a Navy town, and we owe them a special debt. As the men of the Stark went to sea to help their country, it is our turn now to help the families they left behind. As the President said, in this time of intense grief, we have the simple assurance of each other. Our caring and compassion is our commitment to the families among us who have served us with life itself. I'm Deborah Giannolis. I'm Tom Wills. Good night. <laughs>